Well, welcome back to the channel, everyone. As you can tell from the intro, today's discussion is gonna be about tower climbing. The other day before the cold weather hit, I decided to go up and take some old antennas down that I were no longer using. They're uh, some uh, 40 meter slopers that somebody had talked me into and I really didn't like the way they performed. So I, they've been languishing up there for a couple of years and I decided just to get them off the tower before they wrap themselves around any more guy wires. And I also needed to fix my uh, Cushcraft A4S up there. Uh, the center boom uh, supports uh, had broke and it had twisted, which then in turn broke the coax off up there. I tried to use it during CQ Worldwide a little bit, and that's when I noticed that uh, that center conductor on the coax had, had broke off. Uh, it was obvious that the element was out of whack, but I tried to use it for just a little bit, but it didn't work. So it prompted me to go up and fix it. And I set the camera up and got a little bit of footage. Uh, I didn't take one up on the tower with me, which I should have. I found some interesting things while I was up there, but I wanted to go through tower climbing, uh, a video about it. I've promised it for a long time. And the reason, I, and I've tried making this video two or three times before, but it ran too long and I just didn't like the way it turned out. So we're gonna do a very abbreviated version of uh, a tower climbing video today. This is not meant I'm going to say this first off, this is not meant to take the place of professional training. That you really should, if you're going to spend any amount of time on a tower or any time on a tower, you really should have some professional training. Uh, if you go to a good uh, tower uh, climbing and rescue course, they'll teach you how to do self-rescues, rescue your buddy up on a tower. And the reason that's important is most fire departments or search and rescue, they're not really set up to rescue off of towers. So if you have somebody that's hurt up on a tower and that's what you're depending on to get you down, you're liable to be up there for quite a while while they try and figure out how to get you down. Unless you're within reach of a ladder truck, then you know, you're know you gonna be up there a while. Crews have just rescued a man who was stuck high up on that radio tower on Georgia Avenue. You can blame it on today's ice cold temperatures and fierce winds. So while he was up there, the man suffered a case of hypothermia. He told his crewmates he was just simply too cold to make it down on his own. DC firefighters arrived with a ladder that goes up 100 feet, but the guy was 120 feet up. So crews had to rig a harness to bridge the gap. And this whole operation took the better part of three hours, but they did get him down safely. It was one of the most unusual rescues Dayton District Fire Chief Scott Rowlett has ever seen. We don't get very many calls like this. I've been doing it 31 years. I never had one. Cruise High angle rescue guys, they'll get you down eventually, but it's not going to be a fast process. So when you go to a tower climbing course, they teach you how to rescue yourself if you need, need to. And how you would do that is with a device like this. This is a Petzl id. I'm not going to discuss this on this video today, but if you want to hear more about it, leave in the comments below. Anything else in this video you want to hear anything more about, leave it in the comments below and we'll discuss it on a separate video. We could break it down into little multiple sections. But that's the reason it's really hard to cram a lot of information into a short video and get the information across that you really need. So this is not meant to take the place of any professional training. I really highly suggest you go get some professional training. Uh, I've been through five different companies with uh, that training over the years. I've been tower climbing for about 30 years, was an instructor for a while for the company I worked for. I'm currently not, but you know, a course should run at least three days uh, and a good course will run in probably five days. The one I really recommend above any other training I've ever received is a company called Gravitech. They're up in uh, the peninsula of Washington. Great company, indoor facility. You get to try out all kinds of cool gear while you're there. Excellent company to deal with. Uh, it's gonna cost you some money. I don't know what the current price is. It's somewhere between a thousand and two thousand dollars. And this is geared toward, towards your hams out there. Um, guys that do this for a living, they've probably already taken professional tower climbing course of some kind. This is geared towards the ham radio operators out there that I see all the time. They're using improper gear, uh, improper techniques, and that's what I kind of want to discuss today. And every year I see one or two hams seem like they either get seriously injured or, or fall to their death from a tower. And we really want to avoid that. There, there's no reason to die for your hobby. I know you're the macho guy and 
you're out there doing your thing. My grandpa climbed this way. Well, we don't do it that way anymore. So um, I just want to give you some food for thought on maybe some of the equipment you're using and maybe some better approaches you could take. Number one, go get some professional training. You will, you will thank yourself. Your family will thank you for uh, being able to walk back in the front door and not be at your funeral from falling off uh, doing what you love up on a tower. So with that, let's jump right into it. As you can tell here, the harness that I use is a Petzl Aveo. The one I have, this one happens to have a crawl, um, a sender on the front. I accidentally bought it that way. That wasn't my intent. I never used that, uh, that crawl device. I could see a few instances where I might use it, but I've really never used it. I like this style of harness over other styles like the DBI Sala, Miller, and some of the others. Those, to me, and this is nothing against those harnesses. They're great harnesses. I'm just used to a rope rescue style harness. That's what I started in, and that's what I'm comfortable with, so that's what I keep using. Nothing wrong with the DBI Salas or the Millers or Elk River or any of them. They're more of a construction style background, uh, the way they're built, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Like I said, I just prefer rope access harnesses. The main reason I, I keep using this one. That and these have loops on the back of them to hang uh, stuff off of. And we'll get into that in just a minute, why that could be good or it could be bad. So the one thing I want to discuss though is improper harnesses. This is not a proper harness. This is a rock climbing harness. It's not made for tower climbing. Very quickly, I'm gonna go over this. Again, this is a, there's a lot of discussion here that we could spend a lot of time on, so I'm just gonna skim through a lot of this stuff. If you want more information, comment below. But quickly, these are not proper tower climbing harnesses for a few reasons. Number one is they don't direct the force in the event of a fall in the proper locations. And I've climbed with these when I first started climbing. All I had was a Klein uh, lineman's belt. That's what we learned on back then, you know, back in 1991. And luckily I never had any real incidents with it where I had to uh, rely on that for a fall protection. It was a work positioning harness. We did a lot of free climbing back then, which is a terrible idea. This is the number one reason why um, people fall from towers and die is they're not connected to the tower 100% of the time. So those are cool for the, the day that they were used in. We're past that. Get rid of that junk. Don't be climbing towers with it. I know you macho guys out there. Well, if I start to fall while I'm free climbing, I can just reach out and grab a rung of the tower and, and arrest that fall and I'm okay. I've heard a couple people say that, believe it or not. The Gravitech course that I went through, um, Gravitech also does a lot of testing for ANSI in their facility. They have an excellent test facility there where they test equipment, harnesses, the whole bit. And we happened to be there one day when they were doing a test and they took us in and showed us. They dropped, I think it was a 200 pound weight, might have been 150. Uh, and I think it only fell 8 to 10 inches, uh, something like that, into a uh, just a piece of cable that had no give to it. There's no stretch to it. So it fell into that and they've got a load meter on that and that generated over 4,000 pounds of force, just that small fall. And so if you think you're gonna start into a fall and be able to grab something and stop it, once you're started into that fall, you're sadly mistaken, it's not gonna happen and you're gonna die. So the best way to not fall off a tower is to be connected 100% of the time to that tower. Now what I see many hams do and Again, I'm guilty of this. Back in the day, before I knew better, is they'll take this kind of lanyard. This is a work positioning lanyard. This is to put you, once you're in a location on the tower, this is to keep you there so you can work so your hands can be free. Because on the way up a tower, your hands and feet are your number one. You always have two ways to, um, two forms of attachment to the tower. On the way up, your hands and feet are number one. And you should have a fall arrest lanyard as your number two, not a work position lanyard. What I see many hams do is they'll wrap this around the tower, back to their belt and climb. And this is on the outside of the tower and it just goes up with them. There's a lot of major problems with this. Uh, number one, if you fall, if something happens, you have a medical emergency, you slip, your feet come out from under you, whatever happens, 
and you go down and you're in between your sets of guys or you know whatever type of tower you're on and you go and take a tumble this isn't going to stop you until you hit the next set of guys down so you're going to fall 30 40 feet before you hit something if you're up close to that next set of guys and you're going to generate a lot of force by the time you get there and this is probably going to snap when you when you hit that uh, guy and if it doesn't if you're not that far up it's going to break your hip or it's going to break something on you so <clears throat> do not rely on this as your fall protection this is a work positioning lanyard only okay i see a lot of hams do it that way and think they're safe in fact you know i've just recently saw somebody doing that and it's Completely unsafe, so don't do it. Was a fall arrest lanyard that you should be using? This is the one I use. It's a Miller um, Y lanyard. A nice thing about a Y lanyard is guess what? One of these can be connected at all times while you move the other one up. As you can see here in this video, yes, these things are going to slow you down a little bit. But would you rather be slow and alive? or go up there free climbing with that stupid work positioning land, you take a fall and your family is burying you. I mean, that's, that's the reality of it. So these, yes, they, you're gonna climb a little bit slower, but they're gonna keep you attached to that tower. You're not gonna fall to the ground. This nice little bundle right here, when you fall, this deploys, this is a webbing that's stitched together and this webbing the stitching breaks that's holding the webbing together in, in a kind of a folded up bundle, that absorbs a lot of the energy when you fall. It keeps that forces, those forces on your body down to a manageable level. You're not gonna break anything. It's not gonna be comfortable, but you're not gonna die from it either. So, and you'll probably be able to rescue yourself off the tower if you happen to just fall. Now, if you have a medical emergency or something like that and you're incapacitated, well then, somebody's gonna to have to come up and get you off the tower. But, why lanyards? For the ham radio guys, this is a must. There's, there's a ton of other secondary systems out there. There's SRDs, SRLs, whatever you wanna call them. There's um, vertical lifelines. There's cable ascent, or cables that go up, uh, lad safe type systems. We're not gonna dive into all that. There's a ton of systems out there that you could be using, but they're really expensive and most hams are not gonna be able to afford it. So do yourself a favor and get yourself a Y lanyard. Now, the one thing that's extremely important about a Y lanyard, this connects to the dorsal ring on a proper harness. This is the reason you wear a full body harness. What's the reasoning for that? One, if you happen to be in a fall, it keeps you in the upright position. There's very little chance you're going to wind up inverted. I've got some stories I could share later on. If people are interested, I'll post a video of some of the, the dumb things that's happened to me or I've done over the years. Early on, I wound up inverted in a, a rock climbing belt, and it was just a stupid thing. Luckily, I didn't get really hurt during that incident, but... With a full body harness, it's going to put the forces where it needs to go, which is your pelvic region. region. That's the strongest part of your body. It's going to direct those forces there. That's what's going to be able to withstand that. This is going to keep the force down to around 900 pounds of force when this thing deploys, if we keep in the guidelines of the device, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But... You want it connected to the dorsal ring on your full body harness. You don't want it connected up here to the chest ring. You don't want it connected down below on that belly ring down there. You don't want any of that. You want it on that dorsal ring. The other thing is <clears throat> these are designed so you shouldn't go any further than your shoulders. They should be above your shoulders if at all possible. Now with Roan towers, that's kind of hard just because of the spacing. Uh, I usually, it winds up about nipple height before I have to move it, while the other ones, I reach up and move the other one up, and this one's about nipple height, I move it. The reason for that is if you have this connected way down at your feet, and you start to fall, it's just going to increase the fall distance. And if you're on the heavier side, you may blow through all of that um, stitched up webbing in here and hit the end of it. You're not, it's not going to, you're not going to fall, it's that web is, Webbing is extremely strong. 
but it's going to exceed that 900 pounds of force that your body should be seeing or the maximum you should see. So you don't want to put this like down at your feet. You want that up, up here. So you keep that fall distance six feet or under. Makes sense? That's what these are designed for. The other thing I'm going to say is these all the, the belts, the, the climbing harnesses, these, um, all of it has a weight rating. There's a minimum weight rating, 100, I think it's 128 pounds, and the maximum is 310. Now that doesn't mean a 310 pound guy uh, is safe in this harness. That means 310 pounds with your harness, boots, all your gear on. So if you're one of those guys that likes to carry a lot of tools on your, your harness or your belt, and you're up say 250, well, you're gonna be pushing the envelope really close. And what happens again is you could blow through all that webbing and experience a very hard fall. Now, if you're under 128 pounds with all your gear on, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, it won't deploy correctly. It's made to be about that 128 pound region before it will start deploying and um, absorb the energy. If you're below that, it's kind of like hitting a piece of static uh, nylon webbing. So it's, you're gonna get hurt again. So there's a minimum and maximum. Again, it's 128 and 310 pounds. So just keep that in mind. If you're a big heavy guy, there are there is equipment out there that's rated for that, but you have to buy it special. You have to special order it. Um, and I don't remember all the, the models right off the top of my head, but if you're one of the heavier guys and you're up climbing, make sure you have the proper gear on uh, just a standard harness. Uh, say you're a 300 pound dude and with your boots and your harness and a little bit of equipment with you, you're up at 350. Well, the standard harness is not gonna work correctly for you, nor will the fall arrest system. Uh, you, you probably get hurt if you do encounter a fall situation. Now, before we talk about the actual tower climbing part, let's talk about pre-inspection of your equipment uh, and the tower. Before you ever step foot on that tower, you should go look at all the guide points, look at all the hardware, take some binoculars, look up there, make sure all of the guy wire uh, anchor points are still intact. You don't have any frayed cable up there. That's a completely different discussion. If you do, there's ways to mitigate that, but we're not gonna get into that with this video. But you need to make sure all that hardware is in place before you start climbing. As you climb, make sure to stop before you get to each guide point. Look up, inspect it again now that you're up closer because sometimes you can't see everything you want to from the ground, even with binoculars. So as you're climbing, inspect the tower as you go up. Look up once in a while. Make sure you're not climbing into some hazardous situation where you've got a guy wire just about to break. And usually on most guy wires, where the breakage will occur is right at the thimble, where it rolls over that thimble, if you, especially if you're using small thimbles. It's a really dangerous location. Uh, those, cave, those wires will break and you can't see it from the ground till you get up there and really inspect them. And you'll notice some of the strands are broken. And that's a, that's a definite watch out situation. Get off the tower. Again, there's ways to mitigate it. We're not gonna talk about it on this video. But inspect the tower as you go up. Make sure everything's kosher. And probably more importantly, well, it, it's all important. Inspect your climbing gear before you ever put it on, inspect it. Go through, make sure there's nothing cut, no abrasions that's gonna be dangerous. Inspect your gear. Um, I inspect it when I go, before I go up the tower and I do a quick inspection when I'm done just to make sure everything's kosher. It's also a good way to ensure that you've got the proper gear with you when you come up and when you come down that you haven't left something on the tower. If you normally climb with the same equipment each time, you'll know, oh, well, I left something up there. I left a pulley or something because it's no longer on my belt. So that, that's just uh, a general rule. Inspect before you climb and inspect. do a quick inspection after you climb. Make sure everything's as it should be before you put it away. And as you climb, inspect the tower as you climb. If you see a hazardous situation, get down off the tower. You can fix it later. You can deal with it later. It's not worth risking your life or your ground crew's life if there's something wrong up on that tower. So I just wanted to get that out of the way real quick before we start talking about the actual climb itself. Now, again, once you start climbing, 
your feet and your hands are your number one. Your fall arrest lanyard is your number two. Your Y lanyard, that's your number two. So if your mains fail, something happens with your fingers, feet, legs, whatever, that lanyard's gonna catch you. What I see a lot of people doing that go through the training is they get it in their head that this Y lanyard's not gonna do you any good until you're about 20 feet up. And there's a bunch of math involved in why that occurs, but in short, the lanyard itself is six feet long. It deploys, if it fully deploys, you're gonna be out about another six feet, so there's 12 feet. Then the height of your body, the average guy, you know, I don't know what the, what the average guy is, five, eight, say you're six foot tall. Well, then you're up to 18 feet, and then uh, about a foot or so of harness stretch, because the harness is gonna pull up a little bit when, if you fall into it. So technically your feet might hit the ground if you're under 20 feet in height and you take a fall. Yeah, your feet might hit the ground. What people fail to understand though is that lanyard's still probably gonna save you life because what's the most sensitive part of your body? It's your head. You don't wanna hit your head on the ground. If you're in a fall situation, that lanyard, because it's connected to that dorsal ring on your back, even if you're closer to the ground, it's gonna yank your head, that part of your body, up away from the ground. As you fall, that part's gonna go up. The rest of your body might hit the ground. You might break a leg. You might you know, mess up your hip a little bit because that part of your body hit the ground. But it's gonna keep your head from smacking the ground. So my general rule is, as soon as I put a foot on that tower, that Y lanyard is connected and it stays connected the whole way up and the whole way down. It's just good insurance. It's a good habit to get into. Again, you're gonna climb a little slower, but you're gonna be safe. Okay, so on the way up, your hands and legs are number one. Your Y lanyard, your safety, your backup system. And once you get up to where you're in the position where you wanna do some work or need your hands free to tape something up, whatever, what becomes your number one? Well, obviously it's gonna be your work positioning lanyard. That's, you put that around the tower, Connect that up, that becomes your number one. What's your number two? Well, it's gonna be your Y lanyard. For all practical purposes, for most hams, your Y lanyard's always gonna be your number two, and it should always be connected 100% of the time, no exceptions. This is how people fall by not being connected to that tower 100% of the time. Guaranteed, 95% of ham radio-related falls from towers could be avoided if the ham had been connected to that tower 100% of the time. Simple Y lanyard with a proper harness and they may have had a bad day. They may have had some um, rash from where the, the harness deployed, you know, in the crotch area, but they would have walked away from it most likely. So always have a number two and that's gonna be your Y lanyard. There's a hundred other systems out there that could be your number two, but for all practical purposes, for the ham radio guys out there, it's gonna be a Y lanyard. That's its cheapest, most cost-effective way of doing it. We're getting pretty close to the end of my spiel about this equipment for today. I, again, I wanted to keep this video fairly short, just a brief, some food for thought for you hams out there that decide you're gonna go start climbing towers. I want you to do it the safe way. I want you to go get professional training. If at all possible, there's outfits that offer excellent training out there with a couple exceptions. I've went through a couple courses that I wouldn't really recommend. Um, and not all of them, I'm gonna throw this out there. If, because all of them are gonna teach rescue. If they say one of your main rescue tools is your knife, well, I'd be a little leery. And I've been through a couple of them that still say a knife is part of your rescue system. A lot of the other information they provide is good. Just kind of avoid the knife thing. If you're in a stressful situation during a rescue, to me, introducing a sharp object up there and cutting somebody else's lanyard to get them loose from the tower is kind of a dangerous situation. There's, there's easier ways to do it. There's four to one systems that you can pick somebody uh, real easy and get them off of the weight of their, their lanyard, hook them to your, um, your harness or uh, a descender device, that Petzl-ID is an excellent device. 
I prefer it more than anything up on a tower for rescues. You can put them on that, make sure it's got the weight, and then just simply disconnect the, um, their lanyard from their belt. You don't have to get a knife involved and wind up accidentally cutting the wrong one or cutting your own rope or whatever. I just don't like the knife idea uh, during rescues. It's a last resort. You should have one on the tower with you. It's a, but it's a tool of last resort. If it's part of the main curriculum that you're going to use a knife for rescue, um, I, don't, I would avoid that vendor. Let's just put it that way. And I was involved in an incident. Uh, we were practicing rescues with one of these companies, and uh, I had somebody cut. They used webbing as a fake lanyard, just a, some one-inch webbing, and tied it in a loop around... <laughs> I'm not sure why they tied it uh, to um, kind of that belly D-ring on the belt, uh, but they had the guy that was rescuing me cut that, but the problem was he hadn't taken up the slack and the land, the, um, it was a belt set up, uh, and he's supposed to take all that slack out of that and then hang from his harness and then cut that loop. Well, there was about eight, 10 inches of slack in that thing, and he cut that, and... It did not feel good. Uh, fall, you're already arched backwards in the position they had me, and I fell that eight to 10 inches, and um, I could barely walk the next day. It, it cracked every bone up my back. It was, it was not a good deal. So anytime I hear anybody talking about using a knife as a, as a rescue item up on a tower, I just kind of cringe. So enough of that. The one last thing I want to talk about on this video is on your Y lanyards, these connectors when you're climbing up a tower, these you do not want to connect these to the little side rungs, the cross bracing on the towers, because if you do take a fall, you want something that's extremely strong to absorb that force. Now, if everything works correctly, whatever you connect to shouldn't see more than about a thousand pounds of force applied to it. But industry standard is you want about a 5,000 pound rated anchor. And there's that you could, that's a whole deep subject you could dive off into. But on Rhone towers, generally the legs are your strongest part. So you'll want to attach to the leg of the tower with these. But one of the problems with doing that is it puts this at kind of a funky angle when it's connected to the, the leg. So you want these up to the current ANSI standards. The older ones, they could, if they were side loaded, the gates were side loaded, or you get some side loading on these but especially the gates, if there was side loading on them and you took a fall, these things could pop out and no longer have a closed connection there. So you would survive the initial fall. This thing would open up, it would bend out, and it would bounce up just a little bit, enough for it to become off the whatever it was connected to, and the person would fall. Even though they survived the initial fall, that little bounce back up, you know, it, it will be it becomes disconnected because of uh, side loading on the gate or this bends. Those older ones could do that. These new ones, they're rated so high that you really couldn't do that. The only problem is a lot of them are fairly heavy now. The old ones used to be really light. This one's made out of steel, so it's fairly heavy. They do still make some aluminum ones, but th this isn't that big a deal to carry up with you. So. I just wanted to point that out. Do not connect to the, the cross bracing in the tower. It, it might hold up or it might not when you take a, if you took a fall. Last thing I want to talk about is the macho attitude of people that climb towers, uh, especially ham guys. I've ran into a lot of these guys. Well, you know, all I use is a Klein lineman's belt. It's what I've used for the last 30 years. These are the same guys you read about that take tumbles off of towers and die because they're not connected or they get stuck up on a tower with some injuries because what should have been a simple incident of maybe just a little bit of a fall, they fall into that thing and it winds up hurting them, breaks a rib, breaks a pelvic or your hip. It does bad things when you're not using the proper equipment. So that's the reason I say don't use rock climbing belts, don't use those Klein style um, lineman's belts. The, the rock climbing stuff, the reason rock climbers get away with it, most of them are using dynamic ropes. So with somebody belaying them. So there's a lot of give in that system. So even if they take a tumble, by the time that dynamic rope stretches out and the guy on the ground scoots a, 
a foot or two from the belay. The whole thing's got a lot of give to it. When you're talking about tower climbing, nothing has give to it. You're using static ropes. Um, almost everything on that tower is static in nature. It's not going to give when you fall. It's just not. So you need something that will, and that's why you use a fall protection lanyard, an energy absorbing lanyard, a Y lanyard. That's the reason you use those things. It's not any other reason than to protect you. Yeah, it's going to, again, it's going to slow you down. There's no doubt about it. You're not going to be able to free climb or climb as fast as you can when you free climb. And I've done tons of that in the past. I, for the last 15 years, I haven't done any free climbing. I just won't do it. After I've seen the results of many accidents, it's just not worth it. Slow down a little bit, use your white lanyard and keep safe. That's all I got for you today. Just wanted to bring that up. Again, tower climbing stuff always seems to bring out the worst and best of people because everybody's got an opinion. Or if you've got questions, a lot of people have questions about uh, tower climbing. So leave it in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer them. And if we need a couple follow-up videos on specialty type things, or you've got questions about how to raise antennas with trolley systems or anything like that, leave them in the comments and we'll get to them. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next video.